Um, and for me, I think this is sort of one of the reasons one, one might care about modular life curves to begin with. Um, so here's, this, here's the question. So, so I'm going um, to fix five complex numbers. So very general. So the question is, uh, for how many t uh, is the hyperelliptic curve? So the hyperelliptic curve of genus 2 of, oops. Uh, so we'll call it ct, is going to be de defined by the equation y squared. Um, so, OK, so it's going to be branched over the, these six points. So x minus a1, x minus a5, x minus t. Uh, d elliptic, by which I mean there exists a cover of some elliptic curve of degree d. So, so e is an elliptic curve. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first sanity check is why would you expect this answer to be finite? So why finite? Well, okay, so uh, as we know, there's a, there's a three-dimensional family of genus 2 curves. And so how many, among these genus 2 curves, how many of them uh, have this property? Um, well, um, so such a map, uh, so th this will have two branch points by Riemann Hurwitz. And so if I think about the family of covers, so if I think about just the family of sort of all covers of a genus 2 curve, mapping to a genus 1 curve of degree d. Um, so it's a standard fact. Well, I can turn this around and say, if I specify the, the base curve and the, the two branch points, then I get finitely many covers after, well, I get a unique cover after specifying the monodromy. Um, so in particular, I get finitely many covers um, if I just specify the base with its two branch points. And so we have a two-dimensional family of covers. OK, so uh, okay, then you have to give some argument to, to, to convince yourself that you know, if you have one genus 2 curve, you don't have infinitely many maps coming out of it. Um, but the point is now I have a two-dimensional family. If I start with a one-parameter family, I should expect to see finitely many intersection points. So I should have finitely many fibers that live in this family. OK, okay so how might you hope to answer this question? Uh, well, so I've defined for you a family um, I guess over P1 um, inside M2 bar. So over here I have sort of, um, I have a map like this, which I guess I will call phi, and it sends T to this curve CT. And on the other hand, I have this locus of de elliptic curves. Um, but I'm working M2 bar, so I need to take a closure. So this is a closure of a de elliptic locus. Right. And what you want to do is you want to intersect these classes, right? So you want to take these classes in the Chow ring of M2 bar, and you want to multiply them. So I uh, uh, want to intersect in uh, the Chow ring, or if you want, the cohomology ring of M2 bar. Um, and by M2 bar, I will always mean the, the stack. OK. All right, so the problem with this, as I've stated it, is that um, I've done some dr something drastic, which I've said, which is I've said, take some locus and take its closure, right? And this is a, um, and the problem with this is, well, I mean, there are a number of problems. One is that um, a priori we have no idea which boundary curves are in this closure, right? Um, and another problem is even if we did, you can start with some sort of nice locus in M2 without a bar and take its closure and get sort of something sort of arbitrarily bad, right? You could introduce sort of horrible singularities. Um, you could you could pick up sort of sort of really bad deformation spaces. Um, so I mean, uh, so, 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 so the problem is that, is that uh, taking closure is sort of difficult. And in particular, the question arises uh, that sort of what are the limits of uh, smooth elliptic curves. Right, so our prayer is not so obvious. So let me inf instead uh, sort of phrase a, what turns out to be a more reasonable question.
So, better question. Is what if I just remember the whole data of the family, of the cover? So, instead I can ask what are the limits of branch covers? Um, so this is essentially answered um, in the paper of Harris and Mumford, which uh, we've already heard about. So this is the paper in which they prove that MG is general type for G large. This is Harris and Mumford. So 82. So what do they what do they do? So they show that there's a proper. Um, okay, so I'm going to throw some adjectives up. So Cohen Macaulay, uh, Lee Mumford stack, which I will call. Uh, curly ADM, so G over H comma D. Okay, so this is just some object um, containing a dense open substack, which I'll call ADM circ. And so I'll tell you what the dense open substack parameterizes. So these parameterizes, th these parameterize, or this parameterizes. Parameterizing. So degree D uh, simply branched covers. Um, from a genus G curve to a genus H curve. Okay, so I guess I'll write the genus up here. Uh, where X and X and Y are smooth. Are smooth and let's say connected. So I have this open substack of sort of nice objects, of, of sort of honest covers of curves. And what Harris and Mumford do is they, they compactify it. Right? So this is some kind of open stack. And then um, they give some, some bigger moduli space um, that uh, allows these things to degenerate. Okay. Um, so, okay, so what do these parameterize? So uh, this compactified stack parameterize Parameter size is something called admissible covers. Okay, so let me tell you what these are. Yeah, simply branched. Oh yeah, so. Okay. Right, so okay, so at the beginning I said I said pick the points uh, very general. So yeah, pick them general enough so that you only get simply branch covers. Yeah. Okay, so what are admissible covers? So definition. Alright, this takes a bit of setup. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use the same notation here. So X X to Y, this will have genus G and H, and these will mean the arithmetic genus. Okay. Um, so this is going to be a finite uh, degree D. So this degree D means degree D over every component of Y. Uh, morphism of nodal curves. Okay, and I'm going to call the branch points. Uh, well, okay, so I'm, gonna th I'm just going to think about, for now, I'm just going to think about the branch points that are in the smooth locus of Y. Um, so I'm going to call them Y1 through YB and Y smooth. Okay, so with smooth branch points. Okay, so that's the setup. So F is admissible if, okay, there are going to be four conditions. Okay, so one is that when I take the cover with the, sorry, the base with all of its branch points, I want, I want a stable curve. So two, I want F to map smooth points to smooth points and nodal points to nodal points. Okay, so I'll just write this in the following compact way. So X is smooth if and only if uh, its image is smooth. Okay, I want F to be simply branched over to the YI. Okay. 
So, so far these are fairly mild conditions. Okay, and the crucial one is called the balancing condition, so balancing. Or at least that's what I'm going to call it. Um, so for each node of y, um, let's see. So the ramification indices uh, over the two branches are equal. Okay, so let me let me explain what this means. Okay, so what, what, what do I mean here? So, so uh, okay, so F is some kind of cover. Uh, um, and so if I zoom in on, on some node of Y, so this is supposed to be a picture of a node. So I have, so, okay, so this, this condition says that nodes have to map to nodes. So I can look at these two nodes and I can say that, so each node has two branches through it. And, well, one branch down here has to map to some branch down here, and the other one maps to the other one. And at this node, there's going to be some ramification index on both sides. And I'm just requiring that those two branches have the same ramification index. Okay? So another way to say this is, um, well, uh, okay, let me erase this cartoon. So if I look at the deformation space, if I look at the complete local ring down here, I'll get something that looks like this. Or maybe, I think I call it Z. And then the map will go in the other direction. Okay, so W and Z are the two branches here, and X and Y are the two branches here. So the map has to look like something like W goes to um, X to some power, and Z has to go to Y to the same power. Okay? So the condition is that these two numbers are equal, these two integers. Okay? And X is stable as well. Uh, no, I didn't say that. No. Yeah. So let me give some examples. Okay, so are there any questions about this definition? Okay, so I think I started at 53, is that right? Okay. Oh, I think I started a little later than that, right? Okay. Okay, thank you, great. Um, all right, so let me give some examples. So we'll start sort of reasonable and then I'll try to convince you that these get kind of wild. Um, okay, so one, one easy way, way to make admissible covers is you can start with sort of nice covers of smooth curves and then start gluing together nodes. Okay, so the simplest, the simplest example of this is I can start with um, a double cover of P1. So, looks like this. And then, uh, okay, let's see if I can use... And then I can start gluing together some points. So I'm going to just pick two points down here away from the, the branch points. Uh, I'll glue these two points together, then I'll glue these two points together, and then I'll glue these two points together. Um, and then I get a picture that looks something like this. Uh, uh, okay, maybe that was the wrong way. Okay. So I've set this up in such a way that I've made two nodes upstairs that map to the one node down here. And the value of E here is just one, because I've glued together points where this map is at whole. And then I still have my two branch points. Okay. And this is a stable curve, right? This, is, this has arithmetic genus one and it has two marked points. Okay. Uh, cool. Um, okay, let's, let's do something a little wackier. Um, so one way to, so okay, so I'm gonna start Okay, so this is, so the base is going to be, so this, this has a irreducible base, so let me make one with a reducible base. So let me start with a, uh, an isogeny of elliptic curves. So this will be just any map from E to E prime. And then on the base, I'm going to glue on a P1 with two marked points. Okay, so I need to put marked points on here so that the base is stable. And, okay, so now I need to add a bunch of components over this P1, right? Um, okay, so let's, I guess this map is degree four. So here's one way you can do it, right? So you can, I'm going to attach two P1s that just map isomorphically. And then, well, I need to have two branch points, so I need, uh, I need a two to one cover, right? So I can, okay, this picture's gonna look kind of, let me try to redraw this. All 
All right, I'm going to sort of cheat and draw this sort of backwards. So I have two P1s mapping isomorphically. I have some kind of, oh, shoot. Okay, so that's going to be my E, and then I'm going to attach another P1, but that maps sort of via two to one map down to this P1. So I have, I have three copies of P1, and all but one of them map isomorphically to the P1 down here, but I have one that has degree two where I get these two branch points. Okay? And let me point out, this cur this, 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 uh, the source curve is not stable, right? Because as, as just as a curve, it's just an E with three P1s attached to it. Um, and all three of them have not enough uh, nodes. Right. And again, I have four nodes up here, and my, my, my E is going to be one. Okay, so this is example one, two. And let me do one more example. I'm not going to explain it in detail, but I just want to sort of draw a weird looking picture. Um, okay, so this is going to be a genus one curve. These are going to be, these are all going to have genus zero. Um, okay, so I'm, go I'm first going to map to a P1. Um, the genus zero curves are going to map by uh, sort of uh, x goes to x to the a. All right, so it's going to be totally ramified at two points and unramified everywhere else. So I'm writing in the ramification indices at these points. And then the genus one curve maps to the genus zero curve by some map uh, that's totally ramified at two points and simply ramified at two other points. Okay, so this isn't quite enough, right, because I have a bunch of nodes here and no nodes down here, but I can do the following. I can say, well, look at the two points, um, look at the two sort of highly ramified branch points and glue them together. And this will be a curve of arithmetic genus one. And this is now an admissible cover where at this node I have five modes mapping to it, and I've made this ramification index as large as possible. And you can imagine, I mean, you can make this polygon have any size. So these things, um, even though this just has arithmetic genus 2, and this just has arithmetic genus 1, um, which are the numbers we're dealing with in this, in this talk, um, the admissible covers can get quite complicated. Great. Any questions? Okay. So the upshot of all this So I have a forgetful map. So I have a map where I can just start with an admissible cover. Okay, so let me specialize to the case of genus 2 and genus 1. And I have a forgetful map that only remembers the source. Right, so I can just remember the source. And what I want to say is, well, okay, so it takes some cover and just remember x. But this is not quite good enough because, as we already noted, um, often you get non-stable curves. So you can't just take x, but you have to take x and sort of stabilize it. Right, so you have to contract um, non-stable non, non components. Right, so for instance, uh, in these cases, I think you get uh, sort of an uh, irreducible nodal, nodal curve of genus 2, and sa same over here. Because you, here you start with an elliptic curve, but you sort of glue two points together after you kill all the rational tails. Um, and here it's the same. And so why do we like this map? Well, the image, so let's call this map pi d. So the image of pi d is exactly, so exactly compactifies, okay, maybe exactly is not useful. So compactifies uh, the d elliptic locus. All right, because I'm taking the stack of all covers um, from a genus 2 curve to a genus 1 curve suitably compactified, and then I'm only remembering the genus 2 curve. Okay. And so why is this better than the formulation I, I, I stated at the beginning? So there are two reasons. So upshot. So one reason is that, well, we, we actually have a modular interpretation of this now. So have a modular interpretation. Question. Yes. How, like, how big is the image? Or what's the dimension? Of the image? Yeah. It's a divisor. It's a divisor? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is the computation that we did at the beginning. Okay, I missed Yeah. Yeah, it's a divisor. Um, so we actually have a modular interpretation. Maybe, oh, I also, I should have said, let me say generically finite, because that's. Okay. 
So we have a modular interpretation. So I can tell you, in principle, or I mean, not just, I can tell you what the image of this map is in terms of what the points are. And not only that, we're doing intersection theory. Um, so in order to compute intersection multiplicities, we need to know something about deformations. And in fact, Harris and Mumford give um, uh, explicit, explicit descriptions uh, for its deformation spaces, or of deformation spaces. Okay. And I said before, I, I threw in the word code Macaulay, and because we're doing intersection theory, that's a property we really want. Okay. All right, so in the three, four minutes I have, uh, I can now state the theorem. All right, so for those of you who like formulas, uh, this is for you. Okay, so theorem. So the class of pi d in the Chow ring is oops Okay, so um, these sigma d's, is, this is the uh, sum of divisors function. Um, and these deltas are the, are the boundary classes we've seen before. So this is the class of uh, the closure of the, the locus of irreducible genus 2 curves. And this is the locus of uh, curves where you have a, a union of two genus 1 curves that meet at one node. And by class of this map, well, I told you it was generically finite, so I mean the class of the proper push forward. Okay, so, and then using this, okay, I'm going to write, th this, this is going to be sort of a cop-out, but I'm going to write, maybe, okay, maybe I just won't say this, but I'll say it in words. Um, so using this, right, um, so if you want to answer the original question, now you can do something sort of much more reasonable than before. So now you can just make a fiber square. Uh, uh, so this was phi, this was pi, and you can, I can see, and this will be some finite. This will be some finite stack scheme, scheme. Um, and now you can really just multiply these two classes, right? Um, and you can get a formula once you integrate uh, for this intersection. Um, okay, and I won't write it down. But let me maybe say in the last sixty seconds how you would prove such a formula. Um, so. Um, and this is really made possible um, by sort of Mumford's description um, of the chowering of, of, of M2 bar. So, I mean, so what do we know about it? Well, we know that uh, it has dimension 2 in uh, degrees 1 and 2. So A1 um, and A2 both have rank 2. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to take this locus and you need to intersect it well, okay, so how do you pin down a class in here? You intersect it with, oops, you intersect it with uh, two classes over here that are linearly independent, and you um, invert some matrix. Um, and so how do you do this? Well, um, you can make a list of admissible covers of this type, and it, it's, it's rather complicated. Um, we know they're deformation spaces. And once you make this list, this sort of tells you, it sort of pops out which classes in here are sort of the correct things to try to intersect with. Um, and then using this rather delicate analysis of um, deformation spaces, you can compute these intersections, you can compute their multiplicities, and then you can recover this formula. Okay, I think I'm out of time, so thank you.